let's go ahead and get started. Let's talk today about revenue-based financing, how to do due diligence with a checklist. Our speaker today is Buck Hollister, an attorney experienced with revenue-based funding uh, deals. And today he's going to lead us through a presentation on the items that you need to look at. We will record this and send it to you along with a copy of the PDF version of the slides so you can actually look at this later to see uh, more about it. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, kick off. Uh, Buck, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be able to speak here today. And it's, um, I'm very excited about going through this uh, topic. One of the first things that I would actually look at once a company has actually been identified as far as for a revenue-based financing deal is I kind of create a checklist in my mind as far as for different things to look at. And when you create the checklist, you kind of want to think about how you can go about doing due diligence in a cost-effective manner because if you don't plan out ahead of time, it can quickly be a cost bucket that can go and uh, bloom out of control. And one of the first things that I kind of take a look at to even decide whether you want to go forward with the deal is basically looking at a profile like the key decision makers for the company itself. That would be like the owners, the directors, the executives, and managers. And usually request like an organizational chart and bios of the key personnel, including the board of directors as well. And then what I do is I will go out like on the net um, and like look at like basically like their different profiles, what they've done, see if they actually go and uh, have any bad reviews or things like that nature. And then I also have a subscription to what's known as the LexisNexis Smart Links database, public records database, uh, basically that you can actually go through and look to see if any people have like criminal backgrounds or if there's like against the company itself, that there's a lot of judgment and so forth. And you may want to actually hire outside counsel to run that check for you because they could also then look in like the LexisNexis news database as well. And this kind of brings an example to mind of like a past deal I was working on recently and involved a healthcare company and it looked like it had promising technology and everything else and the investors were looking to put anywhere from 250 to 500k into the deal but the problem that was soon discovered was is that the company and a lot of the key principals had a lot of outstanding claims uh, with uh, the IRS where there were IRS liens and so forth so if any money went into the bank accounts it immediately would have been levied upon by the IRS and there were also judgment creditors so the investors actually held back. And if you're able to actually go through and not have people actually pass this initial round, that would actually save you a lot of money, not only from the due diligence perspective, but also as far as from investing as well. Because you need to be kind of careful too nowadays because some of these companies actually are going and uh, are money laundering type of operations as well as far as involved with the drug cartel and so forth. And that would probably come through if you're doing appropriate due diligence. If they're able to go and get through checklist item number two, the next thing I actually go and look at as far as for the companies is the integrity of their intellectual property rights. I would actually go and look at, for example, their trade secrets, um, get a description about that, any penny patent applications, and if they do have patent applications, kind of pay close attention to see if those applications, how broad their claims are. Because if they're too narrow and competitors can later come in and block them out, you may have limited revenue potential in years two or three or down the road. It would also be prudent at this step if the company is involved with like having intellectual property rights and they're licensing out their IP and so forth to review the license grant terms of the agreement itself. This brings uh, an example of a past deal I was working on where in essence the company thought that they had um, assigned, licensed their IP when in actuality they went and assigned their IP rights and so that limited their revenue potential too as well. And then kind of look at, too, as far as for the founders and make sure that you like, request the documentation showing that the founders and other key developers of the IP rights for the company have assigned it to the company. So that, in essence, for example, you don't have one of the founders that created the key component but never assigned his or her rights to the company and then suddenly becomes hostile to the company and walks. Well, if you invest the money in the company, you're not going to be able to do much with it because that other founder can then claim you know, that you're violating his IP rights. If you're able to get past this checklist item, I actually look at, particularly this is most important for revenue-based funding type of deals, is basically the income statements, the balance sheets, and the cash flow statements. Because you really kind of want to look at the historical trend and see what's happening and so forth. At the same time, if they have audited financials, you should definitely ask for that as well. And a caveat emptor as far as for that is, is that one past deal I was involved with, 
is it actually went through the company did of four different investor rounds. So there were four different uh, preferred stock series, and none of the prior due diligence teams actually picked up on this. The company did have audited financials. It was audited by KPMG, but the problem was is that if you called KPMG, the partner for the contact information they gave never worked at KPMG. And long story short, the audited financials were made up, and a lot of the financials for the company itself were as well. So it's always good just to kind of check and double check and kind of vet your information and so forth, just to be careful, especially if you know on a revenue-based funding side, if your cash flows are going to be coming from the revenues itself. Another close piece to actually look at for the due diligence piece as well is how the bank uh, account structure is going to be structured for the company and the parties involved with a revenue-based financing transaction. Because typically, there's three different levels of bank accounts. The level one would be the collection accounts. Level two would be the trustee account where the funds are flowing in. And then level three would actually go and be the company account and the investor accounts. And you want to make sure what your rights are versus the other parties. And if you're a beneficiary and who the trustee entity is and make sure the trustee entity is credible and so forth. And then it's also prudent to go and get like a statement of stockholders' equity position to kind of see what's going on as far as for that component of the financials, who the different holders are, and so forth. And I always make it a practice that when you're going through RBF deals to request at least a minimum of a three-year budget and financial projections with really the first two years actually being broken out on a monthly basis and then year three actually being on a quarterly basis so you can kind of see the trend and what's going on because if you're expecting to get paid back over a three year time frame you kind of want to kind of manage out your projection and what your um, own personal financials are going to be in conjunction with the company operations. I'd also request a complete and current business plan. I think that's important. It kind of gives you a flavor of where the company's going and what's going to happen and how they're going to collect the revenues and so forth. Another key component, um, especially for RBF deals, are like the aging of the accounts receivable and the accounts payable as well. See how stale they are versus current. Uh, the key is is to basically have frequent uh, collectability in the accounts receivable, or if it's not, if you're dealing with like the bigger companies, such as like Intel or Dell or so forth, if they're a supplier to one of those entities, it's good to look at how frequent they are paid because a lot of times those bigger companies will go and use a lot of their vendors as like vendor financing and delay payments. So you want to build that in as far as for your revenue payment expectations as well. I'd also request like the pricing plans for the product and services, kind of gain an assessment of what their revenues are going to be and their profit margins and so forth if there's been any material write downs in the past and so forth and then if there's been any bad debt experiences and so forth and how the company's addressed it that's important too also ask if there's been any contingent liabilities in the past that have sprung up or even right now current and then also see if you can get an accounts report on the target company's present financial condition because even though you have the audited financials they still might be a little bit old but anywhere from six months or more if you're able to get past this piece as far as for the third one, and this is a critical piece, then I would say the next step you can look at is their marketing itself. I would take a look at what the company competitors are and the market shares of the company versus the other competitors to make sure that what's in the business plan and the financial projections seem to be realistic, that you're going to be able to actually go and achieve that revenue stream. One beneficial way of looking at it is that if the company has a customer base, who are their 10 largest companies? Right now, and who do they plan on going after in the next 12 months? So you can kind of see if their plan is credible or not, and also check to see if they have any fulfilled orders. It's beneficial to request like applicable purchase order forth. It's also good at the same time to kind of go through and review like the sales commission structure company because a lot of times that startup and emerging companies make is they don't properly design like a commission structure for their salespeople. So the revenues they're planning on getting don't always exactly work out according to plan if the salespeople aren't incentivized enough. And then it's also good to actually go and see if there are any studies done for the company, um, any outside uh, professionals and so forth when it pertains to marketing and how to go and do product pricing. If you're able to get past this checklist item, the next thing I look at, which is a critical component, especially for startup and emerging companies, is the tax situation. I, if I was in your position, like federal and state income tax returns for like the last three years, and it's from the IRS, and if you're here in the state of Texas, the Texas Comptroller's Office. At the same time, I'd also look at if they've had historical sales, and those sales are actually subject to sales tax, to make sure they have a sales tax account with the Texas Comptroller's Office. 
a good example would actually be the HostGator situation um, a few years back, where in essence they had set up shop here in Texas. They were actually selling uh, goods and services that were actually subject to Texas sales tax. They never collected sales tax, and so they were subject to back taxes, penalties, and interest of 500k. You don't want to be in a situation if you're funding an RBF deal and then suddenly you're finding that 500k of proceeds are going to be owed to taxing authorities when you originally thought that your um, proceeds or your funding obligations are going to go for growing the company. Another thing to actually look at too on the tax side is making sure the companies actually comply with their employment tax filings for the prior three years, like their W-3 and W-2, and then making sure that they're appropriately classifying their employees as either people as employees or independent contractors. And I'm kind of highlighting that piece because the IRS is like a hairpin trigger as far as for FICA taxes are concerned. If like somebody files a form SS8 with the IRS and says, hey, my FICA taxes aren't being um, collected, even if it's for a de minimis amount, the IRS has heightened scrutiny with it. It's by policy reasons to really focus hard on the company, and that can also cause an expanded audit, and that's the last thing you want. And for some of these companies, they also have different affiliates or subsidiaries in different countries as well. And if they're taking advantage of different tax um, like rates in different jurisdictions and they have transfer pricing agreements, it would be good to look at like some of the terms of those agreements and making sure that they're going to withstand like challenges by the IRS. And the way to do it is like talk to your CPA or basically um, lawyer if they're familiar with taxes as well to give you some feedback on some key items to look at, which is kind of really beyond the scope of the um, presentation today. Once you get past the tax situation and other checklist items, another thing that I think is always beneficial to look at is any existing litigation the company has or pending litigation matters. The thing you want to do is, is that if the company looks like for example, promising IP, you suddenly put in all this money and then it's subject to an IP infringement action. That will quickly eat up the funds and you're not really going to go anywhere. Same time, it's also good to look at any prior or current settlement documentation as far as for like the litigation matters. What exactly is the company going to go and be obligated for? Does it have to take a slice of its revenues to actually go and pay those fast settlements? If that's the case, when you're going through your sensitivity analysis as far as for like seeing if the company can pay you the revenues for your RBF deal, it's good to build that in so that basically you can see is the company giving away too much of its revenue so it's not going to be uh, survive or become a going concern. It's also good to look at the same time the company's insurance policies to see if like basically if there's adequate coverage. For example, I recently was going through an M&A transaction which is slightly different but it's kind of on point is that there was actually an escrow that where the company is going to be liable for up to $60 million. Well, the issue was that the company only had insurance and that to be able to cover, provide coverage up to only $5 million. So there's a $55 million delta or gap. That's something you definitely want to make sure the company addresses before you put your money into it to make sure you have adequate coverage as well. I'd also request like a list of unsatisfied judgments. That's always prudent to be able to look at so that you can kind of see what's out there. And if you get past that step, Another important step to actually look at, because if you're for RBF deals, if you're coming in on the equity side as opposed to debt, you want to be able to look at the company's articles of incorporation. That like document itself, basically, if you have rights in there, more often times than not, the rights in that document are actually going to see the rights what's in other documents, and it puts you in a good position. And you also want to see if there's anything in that document that would prohibit or prevent you, um, the company, from paying you qualified dividends and getting money out as far as for the RBF deal. I'd also request um, the company's bylaws, look for prior versions as well, and particularly look at the shareholder agreements, because if there's other preferred stock type of deals, more often than not they have in there where it prohibits the payout of qualified dividends. And if you're doing an equity-based RBF deal, that's going to be a problem. You'd want to have as basically a contingency for you going and actually investing that they go and look back to those other investor docs and amend them so you're able to go and uh, get the money out the way you want. And then just make sure that with the areas where the company is actually doing uh, business in, it actually has certificates of good standing. Another thing to look at, too, that's related to the corporate governance is basically the cap table. Kind of get an idea of all the different series of investors and so forth and who's going to be involved and see what their rights are versus you. If the company's just starting out and you're kind of doing like a Series A deal for an RBF deal, 
it's you're in a better position because then you don't have to go through and look as many details and see what's going on. You also want to make sure at the same time that you know the company if they're issuing like stock options and so forth that those options and that are being priced in accordance to basically a 409A valuation or some other type of benchmark or safe harbor so you're not going to have to deal with IRS issues down the road as well. Um, and then once you get done with that, another key area to actually go and look at would actually go and be like the company contracts and agreements. And particularly if you're doing an RBF deal, if the company already has like existing loan agreements, more often than not, the lenders will probably have some type of protective covenants in their loan documentation prohibiting payouts to dividends. Some of my clients actually say, well, do you think the bank is actually going to go and amend their loan agreement to be able to go and allow me to get uh, money out this way? And it's been my experience that if the company's actually going and experiencing hard times and if there's money coming in for the RBF deal is what's going to save it, lenders typically don't want to go through bankruptcy proceedings with their clients until they have more flexibility. But again, everything's fact specific and it's just always good to look at because you don't want to do an RBF deal and then suddenly find that the company's in violation of its existing loan agreements. I'd also look at like the purchase agreement, contracts with the suppliers, vendors, and customers. Kind of make sure that basically the revenue streams and the costs seem to have some type of stability to them or predictability so you know what's going on. And then at the same time, I'd also look at basically like insurance contracts because if you're coming in for an RBF deal, more likely than not, if on the equity side, you're probably going to want like a director position. Well, if you have a director position, there's always like a lot of liabilities associated with that from a fiduciary standpoint and so forth. And so you want to make sure that there's a DNO policy or a director's and officer's liability policy that's going to be in place with an adequate deductible and at the same time basically um, sufficient limits of insurance. One of the things to look at when you're going through and analyzing that would be to make sure that the defense costs or the legal costs are outside the limits of insurance so that basically as the legal costs start to mount up and litigation costs, at least you still have those original insurance limits to actually work with. And it's all really policy specific as far as for what's going to work and for the company and so forth. Another area I look at, particularly if you're investing in a company that's subject to like government regulations, you want to make sure they're satisfying all the regulations so that the revenues that are coming in, they're going to be able to keep and not have to forfeit. I basically a lot of times will go through and request copies of all permits and licenses and basically any reports made to the government agencies, for example, if it's like some type of drug company, like FDA reports and so forth. And then also, it's always good to ask whether there are any like, inquiries made by local, state, or federal agencies, domestic or international, because a lot of times the European Union can be much more stringent than the United States in certain situations. And if the company's dealing with like in controlled technology or technology that can be used for both military and non-military purposes, then it's prudent to actually look at like what steps the company's going to actually export you know, its technology in a legal manner. And it's always good to make sure that they have legal counsel involved for that to make sure that there's not any trip-ups. If there's somebody else that's familiar with export compliance regs or ITAR, perfect. But you just want to make sure that they're addressing that so it doesn't materially impact the company revenue because if they're violating that area of law, the penalties can be significant and it can also materially impact the company operations itself. Another area that I look at too as well, is particularly if you're going on the debt piece, is basically what the appraisals are for the company equipment and fixed assets, the real property of the company, um, if there's any easements on it, um, who actually has title to it, if they're actually leasing it, is there any buy option, and then like leases and subleases for the company space expansion plans. Because if they say that they want to expand but then they can't and they have to have all kinds of disruptions to their operations, the revenue projections that they're projecting may not actually happen because they're distracted trying to go and get their foundation operations in place. And other company information to kind of go and look at, one of the areas to always be uh, prudent about is making sure that you request a schedule of all their like law firms, accounting firms, consulting firms, and like other professionals engaged by the company, not only present, but those up to five years ago. So at least you can kind of get a feeling about who represented them, what happened, and if it looks like they're having a frequent turnover, for example, and they're outside accounting firms or law firms, that's potential yellow red flag, what's happening, what's going on there, these uh, professionals walking away, is it uh, just because of differences or is it because, you know, a fraud else? Another thing I look at is like their past and planned press releases, 
you want to make sure the company's not making like promises or something like that that could draw lawsuits and uh, adversarial relationships to the company. And then I'd also request like any newspaper or magazine articles about the company, if there are any, just to kind of go and get a good idea of what's happening. And then I also, if the company's like an e-commerce company or a web-based company, it's very important to look at, too, like the website terms and conditions. If you just have something that's very simple, two or three paragraphs, it might not necessarily be adequate. A lot of times you want to go and get it worked out, like the governing re uh, terms for recalls, uh, or service or product replacements, dispute resolution, um, as far as not only in the privacy, like not only from a domestic standpoint, but from international as well. And then basically, a lot of times for these RBF deals too, besides just the checklist items that I've listed here, they'll probably actually go and be other specific items that you'll probably want to go and think about grabbing. And just going back to the original part of the presentation, the overview, one thing is is that this is kind of like my going through and looking at RBF deals. And for each person and each individual as you're going through RBF, there may be some facts with the company that you may move to point number one. And I encourage you to kind of have a thought process for that because maybe you might want to go and look at the situation if you know there's something going on or their revenue or litigation or any number of other. And with that being said, that pretty much concludes part of the presentation. If anybody has any questions, I'd be more than happy to take them at this point. Well, thank you, Buck. And for those who are new to our webinars, there's a questions box on the lower right-hand part of your screen. Several of you have already typed in questions, and what I'll do is read those off, and uh, Buck will answer those. So if you have questions, go ahead and type them in, and uh, we'll spend the rest of the time answering your questions as well. And, of course, we'll be sending you a copy of the slides and the uh, recording afterwards uh, from this also. So first question has to do with intellectual property and uh, how do you, what, what's the agreement to assign those rights to the company? What document is that, Buck? Oh, as far as for that, um, basically a lot of times what you have, if you go back to uh, slide number two, what I'd usually go and reference that as is basically what would commonly be known as a confidentiality, non-compete, non-solicitation, then IP assignment agreement. More often than not, there's like a couple clauses or provisions that shows that basically the founder or the employee that's actually going and working with the company is assigned over their rights. And one thing you need to be careful about with those agreements is making sure there's adequate language there that's very clear that the person that's working for the company, whatever they're working or doing, it constitutes work for hire. In essence, the company will end up owning it. And if you have any doubts about whether the language um, is indeed actually uh, enabling like the person to sign over their rights to the company, I would say basically be conservative and ask for an amendment to that agreement to make sure that it gets the right language in there so that you can have that comfort level. Right. Next question is, how do you know previous uh, people have rights to the IP? How do you check that? that? That's another great question. One of the ways that I go through and do it is, is that if, um, if I, for example, if a company's formed here in uh, Texas, I'll go to the Texas SOS database, and what I'll do is I'll get all the previous filings to actually see like uh, the prior people that were involved. A lot of times, the officers and directors are actually listed there. I'll also go on LexisNexis Smart Links, and a lot of times, even if the people are not involved with the company anymore, I'll also go and uh, basically uh, see who else was involved historically. And one thing that sometimes comes up is, is that the companies will go and change their names. And that's where what's nice about the Lexus databases is that you can kind of go and see other um, business uh, locations where each of the founders or key people have been working at. And you can ask them, well, hey, what about company ABC? Does that, is there anything there as far relating to the company I'm looking to invest in? And so really for short, it's almost like going through and asking the company and then looking at some of these outside databases and just confirming and vetting. Uh, next question is, how do you know the financials are audited? If, if they say they are, do you believe them or do you have to, where do you go check to make sure they are audited? You know, the, what I did as far as for that deal, probably the best way to do is for an example. On the one deal that I was using to confirm that they're audited, Whatever firm it is, if it's like for KPMG or, you know, one of the big name firms or even another accounting firm altogether, is that I would go on the web and first make sure that that firm exists and stuff like that. And then what I would do is I would just get the permission of, you know, the company principals and then just call that accounting firm and 
firm you know that um, you know a company that's looking to go and receive the RBF deal funds is actually a client from theirs and they actually went through and audited it and then asked them questions as well and if no one at the CPA firm or the accounting firm is aware of that company then that would raise the appropriate flags and you can proceed from that standpoint how do you check to see if they paid all of their taxes, both uh, local as well as state and, and federal? Um, that's, a, that's another good question as well. I'd have to say it's kind of like a multi-prong approach. Is, is that first you would look at like their prior tax returns and if they have other CPAs involved, um, whether it's like multiple CPA firms or not, it's good to go and be able to get um, the right to be able to go to those CPA firms from the, uh, the client or the company and confirm that there's not any issues as far as for taxes. I'd also go to basically the Texas Comptroller's um, website and so forth to make sure the company's in good standing and so forth. And then also ask for basically their sales tax permit and uh, other documentation from the Texas Comptroller's office. Because more often than not, it'll usually show if they're current on their sales taxes or not. And if they don't have, for example, a current sales tax account and you know the company's products or services are subject to sales tax, well, then you know that uh, that, need, that account needs to be set up before you'd want to make an investment. Okay. And how much does LexisNexis cost? Um, that's a great question. You know, un unfortunately, the LexisNexis terms of me are subject to confidentiality, so I can't go and say. And so it's really fact specific. It's something you'd have to go to LexisNexis yourself and ask. Okay. Uh, are these the items you would do in order? I guess the the checklist that you put in is that the the order that you would do them in. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, this is what I usually do. The first thing I usually start out, like once you get like an executive summary, I have a client come to me and say, hey, I'm really interested in this company. Um, I'd like to do like an RBF deal or some other type of deal structure with them. I get the name of the company, and the first thing I do is I go and I look at basically the people. Um, like I was saying a little bit earlier in my presentation, it's kind of fact specific though too. Sometimes, um, you know, they, before you get a chance to actually look at the profile, your client may be coming back your attorney or CPA and might want to go and say, hey, what do you think of the financials or what about this litigation matter? Do you think it might be an issue? And so you might move like step number six to step number one. I'd say the key thing is, is maintain flexibility. Don't keep this as a rigid like checklist item. Sometimes you may want to move things around depending on the situation. Next question is what about websites like Manta, Dun & Bradstreet, etc.? Do you use those? You know, I do. Um, it's just the only thing is, is that that's subject to input from the company as well. And so I kind of see that as like as far as for um, quality, probably a step below some of the other um, tools that I'd use. But it's always good to look at those items too as well just to kind of get an idea. Okay. When you're looking at contracts, what do you look at first? As far as for contracts, one of the key things that I look at first would actually be, for example, companies like uh, heavily into the and their license and their technology, I look at like their um, license agreements, making sure that the agreements are set up so they're licensing the technology as opposed to the IP. Other things I look at is like, for example, like for the like agreements where you're signing over the IP from like the fees or contractors or whatever, make sure the company actually owns. Really, I'd have to say as far as for the scope or circle, I start with the IP piece and I start working out to the other areas and side of the checklist. Okay. On government regulations, where do you find a list of appropriate regulations for each company? You know, what I do is um, I look at basically as far as what industry or um, focus it has. For example, actually going and basically subject, you know, like in the medical space, you know, it could be like um, different like uh, agencies like the Food and Drug Administration or it's I mean, products or something like that. I'll go and ask if they've uh, any of their products are required to be registered. If they're, for example, if there's a drug company coming out with a new drug, you'd want to make sure that you charge for, um, you know, the processes and stuff like that. And then at the same time, for example, dealing with a company that has, um, you know, um, old technology as far as they use for military or non-military purposes. So good to make sure that you know you check with agency like, like the Department of Homeland Security they have the appropriate licenses granted so they can export that technology to other countries. It's kind of really fact specific. You just kind of have to figure out which industry is going to be applicable to. Right. What is specific in this checklist to revenue-based funding versus equity deals? 
That's a great question as well. What I'd say would be uh, specific would actually be the financial information, like as far as, for example, the revenues and then the bank structure itself um, and how those revenues are actually going to flow over to the investors. And at the same time, what I would say would be as well would be, for example, the tax impact because obviously if the company owes back taxes and stuff like that, it's going to owe like um, um, have fewer revenues to actually be able to sign over to the investors. Okay. Uh, those are the questions that have been put in so far. If you have any further questions, please go ahead and uh, put them in. Uh, Buck, maybe go to the last slide and just uh, uh, make available your details in case people have follow-up questions. I guess we would invite any uh, audience member to contact you directly with any follow-up questions on these uh, slides. As I said before, we'll record it and send out the recording with the slides so you have those available later today. Uh, any, any other questions while you're putting them in? Uh, Buck, what, what uh, final information or words of advice would you give the audience there? As far as your final words, what I would say is this, is, is that um, I would basically, on every deal that you do, always go back and make sure like a quick hit emotional decision, I would say kind of go and make sure that you take the time to actually assess the situation and also if like there's other people that are going through have done their due diligence, ask them as well. You might be able to go and piggyback off of some of their efforts and so forth what they've done. But even when you go and get feedback, I would still go through and do a, a slight or cursory overview on each of these areas just to make sure you have a comfort level as well. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions we have for today. Thank you, Buck, for putting this material together. I think it's been very helpful. And I will send that out to the audience members today so they have that checklist there as well. Um, oh, we do have one more question. What is the biggest mistake that most investors make on their due diligence? That's a great question. What I find that most investors uh, make as far as for mistakes and stuff is basically um, – the building the profiles of the key participants in the company. They'll go through, they'll talk to different people, but they don't actually go to the additional step to see, for example, if there's like uh, any outstanding liens or judgments and how that would actually go and impact the company. And at the same time, you know, um, what the historical uh, past profile has been for each of the key uh, personnel that's involved with the company as well. Okay. Well, very good. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions, guys, thank you for signing on today. Have a good weekend. We'll go ahead and close it out here for now, and uh, looking forward to seeing you on the, the next webinar that we have on revenue-based funding. Uh, thank you so much, guys.